All right, I guess uh, I can uh, begin speaking. Uh, welcome back. This is Mark Perry, uh, Everglades Coalition co-chair, along with my co-chair, Marissa Caruso. We'd like to welcome you back to the Everglades Coalition Conference, 36th annual. And uh, we have a special luncheon time today with the governing board of the South Florida Water Management District. We're so delighted to have everybody back. And uh, as, as we did last year, it was real exciting. And I, I'm looking forward to this session as well. And to pre, pre, pre this session, we're going to introduce, I have the privilege of introducing the uh, Governor Ron DeSantis has sent us a, a brief uh, message, and I'd like it to uh, queue up at this time, and let's take a listen to Governor DeSantis. Hi, this is Governor Ron DeSantis. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss our vital efforts to conserve and restore the Everglades. When I first took office, my priority was addressing water quality and protecting the Everglades. Through my Executive Order 19-12, achieving more now for Florida's environment, I charge state agencies to work together to develop solutions to protect our natural resources. I'm pleased to report that two years later, we continue to achieve historic progress. Florida's expediting all 27 Everglades restoration projects prioritized by the Department of Environmental Protection and the South Florida Water Management District. By 2022, Florida will have completed or broken ground on 15 Everglades restoration projects that reduce harmful discharges and send more water south. Last year, we provided over $322 million to restore the Everglades and reduce discharges from Lake Okeechobee. This funding goes to numerous projects, including the EAA Reservoir. After announcing that full funding was secured to complete elevation of the Tamiami Trail, Last year, the design work was completed and the construction contract was awarded. I also announced the agreement for acquisition of 20,000 acres of critical Everglades wetlands, which is the largest wetland acquisition in a decade. This property is in the heart of the Everglades. It's one of the most important places in our Everglades system, and this land will be permanently saved from oil drilling. We have also worked closely with key personnel like the state's first ever chief science officer, the Blue Green Algae Task Force and Red Tide Task Force to ensure that all of our environmental policies and initiative have significant impact and are based on sound science. We also unanimously passed the historic Clean Waterways Act last year. And I signed that law shortly after June. This legislation addresses solutions to minimize nutrient pollution statewide while ensuring the accountability of local governments to carry out state initiatives at their level. House Bill 1091 also passed the Florida legislature unanimously, and I signed this legislation in June. The law increases penalties for sanitary sewer overflows by 100%. We know that clean water is foundational for Florida's economy, and I will continue to prioritize environmental protection and conservation for the future of Florida. Thank you and God bless. Thank you to Governor DeSantis for the video message of support for Everglades restoration. My name is Marissa Carrozzo and I'm the Everglades and Water Policy Manager for the Conservancy of Southwest Florida and co-chair of the Everglades Coalition along with Mark Perry. In the message we just heard, the governor mentioned both the state funding proposed for Everglades restoration, which includes 469 million in this year's proposal, as well as the 27 restoration projects that the state is prioritizing and expediting per the executive order signed in January, 2019. We were actually in the midst of the 34th conference when that order was issued. And a little over two years later, we are excited to welcome the entire South Florida Water Management District Governing Board and Executive Director Drew Bartlett to the annual conference for the second year in a row. We very much enjoyed the breakfast panel last year. And even, even though we aren't in person, which is of course disappointing, we are very grateful that Zoom technology is allowing us to gather virtually. So with that, we are looking forward to hearing from the governing board and agency that is responsible for implementing Everglades restoration at the state level. Yeah. Executive Director Bartlett, Chairman Goss, governing board members, Welcome, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. Thank you, Marissa, for uh, introducing the governing board today. 
Uh, thank you, Governor DeSantis, for your great support on Everglades restoration. I want to welcome you to Hollywood Square's District Edition. I am your host, Drew Bartlett, and I will be challenging our contestants today. If you're tuning in to a board meeting, uh, the business board meeting will be next Thursday. This is our second time addressing the Everglades Coalition Conference, where we like to just engage and have fun. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our contestants to Hollywood Squares. So if you want to see all the contestants, you need to switch your screen to see all the squares on the screen uh, so that you can look at them Hollywood Squares style. All right, there they are. Aren't they wonderful? Uh, that is the board for the South Florida Water Management District. I will introduce them and you can wave. Uh, we have our chairman, Chauncey Goss. We have our vice chairman, Scott Wagner. And then going across the screen, I have Charlotte Roman. Jackie Thurlow Lippish, Jay Steinley, Alligator Ron Bergeron, Charlie Martinez, Cheryl Meads. Thank you, Governing Board, and thank you, contestants, for playing Hollywood Square's uh, District Edition. So, this is a two round competition. The first round will be uh, individual trivia questions for each Governing Board member, and Governing Board, you are free to embellish on your answers. And then the second round is gonna be one question, it's kind of a speed round, and everyone will have to come up with an answer and all the answers will have to be different. So after the two rounds, the judges will confer and declare the winner of Hollywood Square's district edition. This is the Equitable Everglades uh, Conference, and so I can assure you that this contest is equitable in nature. Okay, without further ado, let's get started. So. The first one, as chairman, will be Chauncey Goss. Here is your trivia question, Chairman Goss. I know you used to work at OMB in the DOD section, Department of Defense, and in Department of Defense, they would produce just, uh, they would justify their budget in what they call J books, where they write out their justification. So the question is, Chauncey, what is the linear feet and inches of the bookshelf occupied by the De Department of Defense J books? Oh, that's a great question, Drew. I think it goes to the moon and then maybe comes back, but I'm not sure. At least gets to the moon. I, I've never seen more paper in my life. Um, but we, we did, they, do, they are electronic now. That's a great question. I do speak um, uh, federal acronyms pretty well. So we. Tell us about your experience with those J books, Chauncey. Um, they make great paperweights, uh, and we use them frequently for that because our offices were nowhere near big enough to actually put them in. And we'd have, generally this time of year, every year we would have uh, all the services would bring their, their justification books and then all the components of all the services and then all the subcomponents of all the services and all the sub subcomponents of all the services. So we had, we had a lot of paper and there was absolutely no way in heck anyone could all read it all, much less uh, store it in their office, uh, much less... Uh, keep it in their cubicle, which is basically what we had. So it was, it was always a challenge to, to dispose of them. But it, it was well-intentioned though. Very good, very good. So um, moving on to next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go north to south. Uh, and so I will start the next one while I'll go with Jackie Thurlow Lippish. Are you ready? I'm dun, ready. Dun, dun. All right, this is gonna be a math question. I'm and I know you're not- my sunglasses on, you're too bright. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> so I know you're known for your flights over Lake Okeechobee. So with your husband, Ed. So here's the math question. Ed's plane leaves Stewart Airport toward Lake Okeechobee at 3000 RPMs and an altitude of 500 feet. And there is a 30 knot Northwest wind at that same altitude. How long does it take to get to Lake Okeechobee? That's why we have John Mitnick. <laughs> There's no way I could do that. I, I'm gonna tell you a secret about myself and it might not be totally politically correct, but mind you, I was born in 1964. Um, I, I went to the University of Florida. Uh, I, I was to graduate in journalism in 1986 and I had to stay an extra part of the summer 
because I had to take the math course for the second time that we all at UF called fun for mentals. <laughs> uh, fun for mental, because I couldn't do the math. So um, I can't answer your question. And uh, that's why we have John Mitnick. My job is just to get people excited. <laughs> Very good. Very good, Mr. Lolipish. All right, now we'll go to Jay Steinley. As you know, uh, Mr. Steinley, uh, President Trump's residence is on the Lake Worth Lagoon, and you live on the Lake Worth Lagoon as well. When the president was in town, how much larger is the restricted voting zone from his residence than from your residence? This is something I can I can tell you from experience um, uh, is is a lot more restrictive than you would think. So I'll start with I'll start with that answer, and then I'll and then I'll I'll tell you. And I think last. Last year, I shared an embarrassing story. Hopefully, this is more entertaining, but I'm actually glad the governor is not on live because I might get a slap in, slap in the wrist for this one. But I, I was, um, in my obsessiveness uh, to find new activity, I've taken up kiteboarding. Uh, and, uh, and in this particular case, I was kiteboarding near Mar-a-Lago um, on the ocean side, not on the lake side. And... Um, you know, to much to my surprise, I got uh, I got um, uh, uh, essentially pulled over by a 125 foot Coast Guard cutter with blaring horns and loudspeaker, uh, telling me that I was in a res restricted zone. Um, so now, keep in mind whether or not you know what kiteboarding is. I'm in a bathing suit. I've got my hands full, and I am no threat. And by the way, I'm also subject to the winds of the the wind so they told me to get out of there really the only place i could go was the to on shore uh and while i didn't go on shore right in front of mar lago it was certainly close enough to cause quite a scene so i had four wheelers and everybody um all over me secret service sheriffs and everything telling me by the way qualification this was at the beginning of his term uh, and I didn't know what was going on with the with the uh, restricted zone. Uh, anyways, so so obviously they asked. They wanted to make sure I wasn't a threat. They asked for my ID. Who carries ID when they're swimming? Um, I couldn't produce an ID, and that was a big that was a big issue. So this is where you know you never expect to use a, a get out of jail free card um, in this in this volunteer job. But I said, listen, guys. I can't, I know you want my ID, I can't produce it. So I said to the sheriff, I, I work for your boss. I volunteer for your boss. And uh, the only way I'm gonna be able to confirm who I am is if you call up. Now, luckily he didn't call up, but that was enough to sort of, you know, um, to, to, to get everybody uh, calm. So not, uh, so, so an inch, you know, uh, maybe that is an embarrassing story, come to think of it, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, at least I didn't have to bother the governor to, to confirm my identity. And my kids think that's a really cool story that, you know, almost got arrested by the Secret Service. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think you're a little bit smaller than that Coast Guard cutter, too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our next, next contestant is Alligator Ron Bergeron, who, uh, as you know, has been uh, fighting to help remove the pythons from the Everglades, which is an exotic invasive species impacting wildlife in the Everglades. And FWC and the Water Management District have done a lot to invest in that in trying to combat that invasion uh, with hired help. So, uh, Mr. Bergeron, what is the largest number of pythons captured in a single day by an individual wearing a scarf? And I think you're on mute. There we go. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, the most pythons ever caught <clears throat> uh, in one day, uh, I'm proud to say this uh, crazy guy they call Alligator Ron uh, took out about 80 snakes uh, in one day. And it was interesting that I was in the Everglades on July 4th, uh, 2019 with my film crew. We were out there uh, doing a, a beautiful documentary of the Everglades and, and how important the Everglades is to the quality of, 
of everybody's lives being one of the natural wonders of the world. And I got a phone call uh, from a friend of mine because across the Everglades, the Gladesman's culture, uh, families that's been out there, some of them a century, uh, are on certain islands. So I get this phone call from uh, Possum. And Possum calls, he says, uh, Alligator Ron, this is Possum. And I got a problem and would you come over and help me? I said, well, what's your problem? He said, I got a big snake under my camp. I said, well, Possum, just crawl under there and get him. He says, I ain't going under there. And so being such a good friend, I took the whole film crew uh, and we ended up crossing about five miles of the swamps and we ended up at Possum Head and I went under the camp uh, floor because this snake was, there was two layers of the floor and I seen all the baby snakes and actually they were coming out of the eggs, uh, actually falling all over my head. Actually one little baby snake had my ear and didn't realize how big this snake was. And I took a stick and stuck it up in there. And when it stuck its head out, I grabbed it. And believe it or not, it drug me up into the floor. I tried to get my film crew to go under there with me, but they said, you're not paying us enough to come under there. <laughs> <clears throat> so I ended up pulling the snake out uh, to make a long story short. Uh, it was 18 feet, two inches. Uh, we took out somewhere about 80 snakes in one day, and it was a great day for the beautiful Everglades, removing that many snakes that, that are destroying our natural food chain. So I'm very proud to say that, uh, that I have that record, uh, Drew. Mm. Yes, did you document that, uh, those snakes? Did you check them in with the <clears throat> district? I did, and I've never got paid either, so. I don't think you checked them in. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my donation and commitment to the beautiful Everglades. But a, a great day for the Everglades, I can say. Yeah. That. Well, and I can assure you, Mr. Bergeron, the check's in the mail. Just go stand out by your mailbox, and it'll, it'll be there before you know it. <laughs> uh, I will do that, but I'm not going to hold my breath, okay? <laughs> Very good. All right, next we have Charlotte Roman. Uh, Charlotte, I know you spent time in the Army Airborne as a paratrooper. Uh, and so this is a situational question, okay? So uh, you are in a C-130 aircraft at 1,200 feet flying at night during inclement weather. What is the reference number for the Army code setting criteria on whether to proceed with the jump? Wow, Drew, not only do I have to follow Ron Bergeron in his snake story, <laughs> now I have to dig up my last airborne op that would had to be almost 25 years ago. <laughs> let's, let's see what I can remember. Uh, first of all, it's not as glamorous as some might, might think. Uh, in the Army, you just don't show up, get on the plane, take off, and then jump out of the aircraft. You know, preparation begins several hours uh, before takeoff. It starts with a manifest call, then you practice your parachute landing falls, jumping from a platform. Then you go through your safety checks, and then you finally board the buses and go to the airfield. Once there, you put on 90 pounds of equipment, and you get your safety checks, and you, and you wait around. When the plane arrives, then you file onto the aircraft. After takeoff, you wait around some more. The pilots have to practice their navigation at night, so it could be a few hours. Once on the plane, you just wait until it's time for the plane to slow down and the first jumpers to get ready to exit the aircraft. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the weather conditions can change at any time. So there are people on the ground with instruments monitoring the wind direction and speed, making sure it's okay for the people to exit the aircraft. The first one to exit is usually the commander. 
And the, the commander usually serves as a wind dummy of sorts. So the commander's out, and if it's safe, everybody continues out. Well, more than one night in my career, I was the only one out because after I exited the aircraft, it, the winds picked up or something, and everyone else Gosh. was exiting the aircraft. And I can tell you, I had some exciting landings on those particular nights. Thank you. <laughs> Commander slash wind, wind dummy, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. Well, uh, I like my desk job now, Sean. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. All right, next we'll go to Scott Wagner. Miami Dade. So, uh, this Scott, this is a statistics question. Okay, um, what is the average and standard deviation for the number of friends one can make in Tallahassee in one day when it becomes known that you are also a friend of the current government? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question, and that's a funny question. Um, and I've got a great, I've got a great story for it, um, but. Following, following uh, Bergeron and, and Colonel Roman is no, uh, <laughs> no desirable slot to be in here. I mean, uh, I was just, you know, Bergeron goes under these things to grab these snakes. I was just so happy at the Alapata Flats uh, event that when they opened the box, it wasn't a snake, you know, for the first time. <laughs> it was a little blue heron. You know, this was like the first time in two years that we opened a box and it wasn't like a 14 foot python in it. So I, I was very, very happy to see that little bird take flight a couple of weeks ago. And Charlotte, I did not realize that she was jumping out of airplanes because uh, I, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, but you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I would jump out of an airplane if it was crashing. So her, <laughs> her, her ability to do that is just incredible. So to follow them is, 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 is quite a task. Um, regarding your question, uh, in December of 2019, I had the opportunity to be invited to the, to the governor's holiday party at the, at the governor's mansion. Uh, and it was right after we had had a few months after my wife had had our third child so this was like really a great opportunity for us to get away and and go up to Tallahassee and, ha and have this great time so you know we don't expect to do anything other than go up there and just you know have a few drinks and eat some food and have a great time at the governor's mansion and whatnot which was really the plan and so we we come down from the hotel and before we head over, we stop at the hotel bar and we have a martini or whatever it was. And then we're going to head over for this great holiday party. And when we arrive to the governor's mansion, um, I have two senior staff members who come up to me to say, oh, governor's so happy you're here. He'd like you to introduce him tonight, oh. you know, at the, at the thing. So I'm like, oh, my God, like this, this what I mean? You know, you don't give like a little bit like further advance than like 10 minutes before. You know, I've already got a drink in me. Now I'm like <laughs> totally nervous about about this situation. So I'm like running through people or I don't know too many people up there. I knew a few people, but I'm not really a Tallahassee guy. And I didn't really know that many people. And I was being but I was totally, you know, completely nervous. And then 10 minutes later, it gets, you know, it gets worse. They come over, they go like, well, you know, we're going to have you introduce the governor, but, you know, the governor's, his, uh, Casey DeSantis is going to introduce her husband. I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, okay, great. Back to normal. And then they go, well, we would actually like you to introduce Casey. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, th this is not happening to me. You know, I mean, if you kind of, I think if I would have fumbled the introduction for the governor, he probably would have made fun of me, you know, maybe for the rest of my life. But like if you if you mess up the first lady's introduction, like that's something you don't come back from, you know. So I'm like <laughs> to totally frightened, and you don't know whether you're going on in like five seconds or five minutes or fifty minutes. Right. So I'm like in this total blank stare <laughs> moment, and uh, we go up, and everything is everything goes great. But what I didn't realize, I was so nervous about that. I had 
absolutely no idea. When you introduce like the first lady or the governor at something like this, you are instantly the most popular person in the room. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this. I come down out, off the speech and once everything's over, I'm like literally accosted. I, I was like, I was like Kim Kardashian in the, in the governor. <laughs> it was un- unbelievable. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't really end there. Like we went, we went afterwards to, a, um, after the party, there was like a, we went to the restaurant by the hotel. I was accosted there. And then the following morning, I was waiting for my Uber in the, we were waiting for our Uber to the airport in the hotel lobby. And people are continuing to come up to you. The pow- I mean, to the point where I was like, I think the Uber is going to, I was talking, trying to be polite to people and, you know, really <laughs> talk to them and engage them. And I'm like looking at my phone and I'm looking at my phone and the guy's messaging me from Uber, you know, I'm like, this guy's going to leave. Like we're, we're going to miss our, our ride to the airport. So I, I said goodbye to these folks and I, I left outside. And as I'm putting, helping the guy put the bags in the, in the trunk, two more people come screeching out of the, out of the hotel to like sprint down the thing to say, I was, it was shocking to me. I really, it was one of those moments we went, I, I couldn't wait to get back to Miami. It was embarrassing, you know, but it was, it was, <laughs> it's unbelievable. The power of the office of the governor, you give a, you know, you kind of introduce the guy and then all of a sudden I was the most popular person in town. My, even my wife was like, this is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> you know, we we got to get out of it. We got to get out of this place. But yeah, I think I set the 36 hour, uh, friend record in Tallahassee with, without question. <laughs> There's no, no doubt about it. I came home, I think, you know, when you come home from the beach and you still find sand, you know, all over, you like two days later, you're like, I got sand over here. You know, I was finding business cards from people. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, did the guy stick it in my back pocket like when I wasn't looking. It, it was unbelievable, but um, it, it, it was, it's a very, uh, it, it's a, it was a very foreign uh, thing for me, but it was a very cool, uh, a, a very That's cool. Right. <laughs> Scott, can, hey, Scott, can I get your autograph next Thursday? <laughs> only, only if you give me mine. I, th- I, I give me yours. I think yours is a little bit more valuable. <laughs> You're still the most popular to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a that's a blessing. <laughs> very good. Very good. All right, Cheryl, you're the most Southern board member, uh, and I know you live in Almorada. And so this is a question about Almorada, because I know you used to sit on the city council. Uh, according to Almorada Al ordinance number 27 B stroke C, what are the required protocols for preparation for an approaching category one hurricane arriving from the Southwest direction? Gosh, I'm glad you asked me that. Nobody knows that better than I do. <laughs> so I'm from North Carolina. I'm not as accustomed to Floridians uh, uh, as Floridians are to storms like this or any storm at all. So the worst hurricane in the history of North Carolina was Hazel, and that was uh, Category 4. It was 1954. I was born in 1959, so I missed that one. But in 1996, Fran came over my house in Raleigh on top of us. It was a category three. We lost hundreds and hundreds of trees. And um, I had a two-year-old at the time and slept in the um, bathtub over top of her all night. So now the, the, the measure of a person is, is not what they take away from successes, but tragedies, right? We, we learn coping mechanisms. I find myself in 2010 in the Florida Keys. My husband and my son were in Uganda. A system arises and here comes a category one and I'm new in town and I'm alone. And I have met a few people and I, and I tell them I'm worried and I'm nervous and they explain to me not to be worried because it's only a category one. And that means we're going to party. 
we're going to have a hurricane party. Well, all I can remember is Fran, which was a category three, and I didn't have power, water, power for nine days. And I had a two year old baby to keep clean. And I started getting ready for the storm on my own. And my husband's car is gone. I've got a two car garage and I'm a little bit embarrassed, but I, here's my coping mechanism. Here's my advice to you. <laughs> you go South, you, Marlin, you go in, you get beans, you get water. If you're going to get beans and water, what's the third thing you need? It's not milk. It's not yeah. bread. It's toilet paper. You get <laughs> beans, you get toilet paper. You put it in your car. Keep going south. Stop at Tom Thumb. Go in. Say hello. Get beans, water, toilet paper. Canned beans, dried beans, doesn't matter. Keep going south. Go down to the trading post, beans, water, toilet paper. When you fill up the Yukon, which is a car that holds nine people, I think, when the Yukon and all, all the seats are down. So now I've got an entire Yukon full of those three items. I drive back to my house and I unload it into the garage. Then I go north and I go to the first, to the quick pick, beans, water, toilet paper. And I keep going north. I go north as far as I can until my car is full and then I come home. I do that every day for a week. At the end of the week, the two car garage has become a one car garage because my husband's side is full of beans, water <laughs> and toilet paper. I'm ready. So the storm comes and I'm like in a tin can. I've got all the, and I've got my beans and my water. I didn't have room to unload the last load of supplies, my three valuable, precious supplies. So it's in the car. And I, somebody calls me and says, get on over here. We're having a party. And I look in the rain and the wind and I thought, oh, what am I going to do? So I get in the car and I go. And I, we walk around with a beverage. Now, look, I'm always up for a cocktail party with interesting people. <laughs> but I'm hoping that when I die, I will be sober. I'm hoping that if I have to swim for it, <laughs> that I will be sober. <laughs> but what you do in the Keys when a Category 1 hurricane is coming is... You have good margaritas, you have food on the grill, you have people <laughs> over. And if you invite me over, we put toilet paper, beans and water in a wet wagon and we take it from door to door. <laughs> <laughs> I was given away because my husband was gonna be back in two weeks. And I had to get rid of all of that stuff before he got back. <laughs> so to this day, I have two choices. I can either leave the keys for a storm or I can buy beans, water, and toilet paper. <laughs> it, is my, it is my coping mechanism gone wrong. <laughs> that is wonderful and now i'm sure that's in uh, almorada ordinance that's right 20-03 <laughs> all right very good all right charlie we're going to come back to you uh welcome back charlie martinez to the governing board he got to take a a little reprieve a sabbatical or something like that from the governing board and so now he is back and so charlie i've got a question for you um, I know you spend time in the Bahamas, so this is a wildlife question over there. Dolphins have a well-developed acute sense of hearing. Their auditory cortex is highly developed. How much larger is the dolphin's auditory nerve than a human auditory nerve? I'm glad you asked that question, Drew, because I know the answer. I can't remember right now, but I know the answer. So it'll, <laughs> that doesn't count. So, so it'll, it, it'll, uh, it'll come to me. But um, funny you asked me about, uh, about dolphins. Uh, 
and yes, we spent quite a lot, quite a quite a time, quite a amount of time in in the water. My my whole family. I grew up as a water person, as a boater, and so uh, my three girls and uh, and my wife and I uh, love the water and we're in it as much as possible. And about three years ago, we were out doing one of the things that I love the most, which is uh, diving. Uh, do a lot of free diving, not scuba diving, but free diving. Um, we usually go out and when we're in the Bahamas, we do a little bit of spear fishing and get and get food for for uh, for when we get back home. And uh, when you're out in the Bahamas, one thing that you always have to be very aware of is sharks, right? There's even though there's sharks everywhere, it seems like the Bahamas is a very popular place for them. So. I'm out with my daughter, my oldest, who is much better diver than I am. Um, and we're in about 30 feet of water. Uh, we had just, she had just shot a grouper. And what happens when you shoot groupers, right? Immediately they go and get inside rocks and kind of burrow themselves in there and they're very hard to get back. So her and I had taken turns going down, trying to get the grouper from, from inside the rock. And one of the times when I'm down underneath, in the corner of my eye, I kind of see something big go over me in the water. And when I look up, it was gone. And I said, okay, there was something. I don't think it was just a shadow. Um, so I keep working on the fish. I finally get it and I loosen them up. And as I turn to go up back up, I look and there is a mass above me. I can't really tell what it is. But immediately I'm thinking, okay, it's a shark. So the first thing you do, if you have a fish on hand and there's a shark, you drop the fish and, and you go back up. So I dropped the fish and I started going back up. And as I go up and I see my daughter floating, um, she's looking down. So like, like I said, we were taking turns. And as I get closer to the fish, it wasn't a shark. It was a porpoise. It was a dolphin. Um, so, you know, we all, some of us have done the, dolphin interaction thing that they have in different places around, but it was the first time we had actually run into them in the wild. Um, before I knew it, we were actually surrounded by about 20 of these, of these dolphins, some, some little ones, some big ones. And so when I get up, I'm next to my daughter and I tell her, I said, and she's she tells dad, should we get back on the boat? And I said, you know what, let's get to the boat and we'll drop these, the spears are, 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 uh, our pole spears, let's get rid of them. And then we'll kind of just stay here floating and see how they react and we'll take it easy. So to make up a very long story short and one of the most uh, breathtaking experiences that I've had in the water, we spent about a good 25 minutes uh, basically swimming out there in the wild with a, with a pod of, of about 20 dolphins uh, to the point where we got so comfortable that we would go down and, and just swim very gently um, we got to barely touch a couple of them. They would come right up. And then as soon as you put your hand out, you know, they would like swim away. Uh, but it was a very, very cool and magical experience um, that my daughter and I had. Um, yeah. So no doubt. <laughs> that is incredible. Very cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you, contestants. That was uh, the end of round one. Um, uh, no comment about that. So let's go on to round two. Uh, and this is the uh, speed round. Uh, so I will ask one question and each of you will do an answer. We'll go in a similar order. And, uh, and the question is, and, it, and no answer can be the same, okay? So the question is, you've been a part of the district now coming on two years. And what is the thing that you're most proud of uh, about the district or as part of the district during that two year stint? Uh, and of course, we'll start again with you, Chairman uh, Chauncey. Oh, thanks, Drew. Other than hiring you, I think that the, um, the thing I'm, I'm most proud of with the district is, it's probably not even, a, it's not a dirt project, you know, it's not an infrastructure project. It's more of a, of a change in mentality where we're placing a lot more emphasis on balance because I think that's really important. I've heard I've heard Mr. Bergeron say over and over again, it's it's we, not me. Um, and and I think that that's so true. We're we're treating things like they're not a zero sum game, where you know you have to have a winner and a loser. We're trying to treat things where we can all get along. And I think that this this Everglades conference really really shows that where there's 
there, there is that focus on equity and that, that focus on balance. And I think that that's something I've, I've absolutely seen that in the, uh, in the district over the last uh, couple of years. And I'm, and I'm very proud of it. Hmm. That, that, that's great. All right, Jackie. Okay, real fast. Since I kind of went off script, the last time you asked me that, uh, my other question, I, I have to, to show my husband and, and me uh, flying in this plane. Uh, the River Warrior over Lake Okeechobee, uh, I think over 200 times. And um, I, I wanted to tie this in in that this whole thing started because at the time I felt like, and many people here in our coast by Martin County felt like the district was not being open with information and uh, that it wasn't being transparent. And so my husband and I, I was an elected official in Sills Point. We started flying over, we started documenting, we started sharing. And I have to say that we can do it, but we don't have to do it anymore because the district is doing it. Sean Cooley is doing it. The information is out there open and transparent. And talk about equity, talk about being fair. If people don't have information they can't make decisions for change. I want to thank Governor DeSantis for allowing this to happen because there were others who squashed it. And I want to thank the district, my board members and staff, and just say that I am super proud to be part of an agency that is open and transparent with good and bad information. Algae blooms, it was put out there for everybody to see, they didn't hide it. In a, in a closet somewhere. Uh, John Mitnick's maps, uh, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence's uh, information and others, it is so much more extensive than it was originally. And um, that is what I'm most proud of. Oh, nice, thank you. Uh, Jay Steinle. Yeah, the, Jackie, that's so well said. I'll, 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 I'll extend the same theme of, of, of you and, and Chauncey, which is, you know, it's so hard to, identify an individual project. There's so many to be proud of. And I, I was thinking about this and I think what, what I'm most proud of the district and, and others about accomplishing over the past two years is, is building, creating sort of a collaborative environment where, um, where we're all productive together. We're doing more uh, and we're doing more quickly. Um, so whether it's us working and others working with FWC on alternatives to herbicide use, or 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 importantly, flexibility with the Cape Sable Cape Sable <laughs> Seaside Sparrow SSS whatever um, in the park, uh, whether it's FDAX and helping them, you know, improve upon B maps uh, where we still need to do some work, whether it's DEP and and sort of partnering on innovative technologies to provide new solutions. Um, I think it's makes such a difference to. To, to have all these agencies working together towards the same goals, you know, collaboratively. And, 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 and so that's a, that's a kudos to the district. It's more of a kudos to the, to the uh, DeSantis administration for get, getting everybody on the same track. Mm. All right, thank you, Jay. Uh, Alligator Ron. Okay, can you hear me, Drew? You bet. Well, the first, first thing I wanna say, uh, I really want to compliment the the Everglades Coalition for uh, allowing us to speak here. And over the last few days and over decades, I've seen them bring people together, over 60 environmental groups and uh, everybody uh, being able to communicate uh, where we're all going in the same direction. Uh, I certainly want to thank the governor for giving me the opportunity to to uh, make a difference uh, for all Floridians. And it's been a great honor uh, to see the leadership, uh, my fellow board members. Uh, I'm, I'm so honored to sit with you. It's, uh, it's been great as we go forward uh, to make sure that the future of Florida uh, and the quality of life for future generations are, are, uh, that are there because the most important thing uh, in South Florida, obviously the resource of our 
our waterways and our Everglades. But as, as we've addressed certain things uh, with emergency deviations, uh, as we're addressing uh, obstacles that are in the pathway of a billion dollars of infrastructure and the leadership uh, of everyone at South Florida and all of our state uh, sister agencies and, the, and our federal partners, we're, the vision that, that, that I see by uh, removing the old Tammy, Tammy Trail, by working with DOT to lift the 90-day window on the uh, L-29, uh, the structures of the S-12s to be open year-round, the eight and a half square mile area that's coming up um, and culverts in the L-28, all these things that we're dealing with, with, with is actually going to get us the benefit of the missing links to get the benefit of what we've already built. And it, it's a, a great honor. And I'm, I'm, I'm so optimistic about uh, all these benefits that are coming in the near future. And it's a, a great honor to sit with all my board members and thank you. Thank you, Alligator Ron. Uh, Charlotte. Yes, thank you. I, I want to echo everything that has been said uh, before. I think that what Jackie and Jay and, and Ron have highlighted and, and Chauncey is, is something that comes around once in a lifetime. I mean, not only as board members did we start together on the same page the very first day, which is very, very rare to have that opportunity. And thanks to the governor, uh, we, we all received that privilege and honor to serve on this board. But I think on top of that is the interagency piece that was highlighted. That, that's very rare too. Many times agencies don't work as well together as we've seen so far in, in our tenure on the board. But I'd also like to highlight the people of the district, beginning with Drew and all of the members of the South Florida Water Management District, because every person that I have come in contact with in the field whether it's somebody treating invasive vegetation, whether it's a lease that, that I've had a question on, whether it's a permit, everybody is just first class and committed to this organization and the mission that it has for 9 million Floridians. And, and they are committed to that. And then add to it the pandemic and how this organization had to pivot and change its entire way of operating and still keep all its mission functions going is just incredible. And I've seen a lot of high performing organizations in my lifetime, and I'm sure many of you have as well. But this organization, the South Florida Water Management District is right there at the top. And I'm so impressed by, by what we have been able to accomplish together. And Chauncey, it may not be about turning dirt, but in essence it is because these people keep turning the dirt. They <laughs> keep right. building the structures. They keep building the reservoir. They keep pr providing flood protection, water supply. Uh, you, we could go on and on and on with our mission and all of the various things protecting the environment. And they have not skipped a beat in a year when we've been under pandemic conditions. And I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to serve with each and every one of you. I'm proud of our stakeholders who come together with the Everglades Coalition and all, all throughout the district to help us understand the issues. And it's just been a great day to have to be able to take part in this today. So thank you very much. Is frozen. Is Drew still there? Drew. Oh. Uh oh. Who's next? Drew has, Drew has left Scott. the left the <laughs> stage. Who is next? Scott. I, I, I was next, oh, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to I'm happy to pick it up. I think Drew got, you know, the hook. Right. <laughs> 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 off the stage. Um, 
First of all, Colonel, Colonel, I, I want to, I, I do want to echo what everybody said. Colonel Roman stole my uh, answer a little bit because um, I had never really been involved in a government role like this before. And I was nervous about what I was going to step into with respect to a government agency and the staff at the district. I didn't know what I was getting into. And um, what a pleasant surprise it has been. Um, and more than a pleasant surprise. I mean, it's just been a wonderful experience to engage with staff and to see how, um, how meaningful our mission is to them, how um, passionate they are about what they do and how professional they are and how they present issues to us. Um, extremely prepared, uh, supporting documents on a moment's notice. <clears throat> It really is a pleasure to be part of this um, South Florida Water Management District and to be in this role, but um, <clears throat> I don't want to totally steal Colonel Roman's answer, so I'll, I'll pivot a little bit, but my, um, the most rewarding thing for me uh, has been how much I've deepened, I think, my love for, for the state of Florida oh, and for great. South Florida in general. Um, throughout this process. And that, that is not just dealing with staff who are passionate about what they're doing or issues, but also all the stakeholders, you know, who show up at our meetings and, and, and people that call us about issues that they're passionate about. I mean, people really care. And when people really care and you care about them and you feel for what they're worried about, um, you start to sort of get a lot deeper into, you know, the issues that touch Florida. And for years, I had always felt, even growing up in Florida, that Florida maybe didn't have as rich a history as many of the other states where people had been down here for longer. But when you look at the environmental history of this state, it's as rich and as important and as powerful maybe as any other in the, in the entire country, if not more. And it's a pleasure to hear from people um, on a daily basis from a stakeholder perspective. It's also a pleasure to hear about all your experiences. And that's, you know, right down the line from every board member and their deep knowledge that they have of their respective area. I mean, I hear Chauncey talk about, you know, his uh, hometown and Caloosahatchee issues. And I hear Jay Steinle talk about Palm Beach and he'll tell you all about the Lake Worth Lagoon and, Cheryl will tell you about the keys and Jackie will fix you on, on St. Lucie County pretty good. Um, and Charlotte will let you know. And, you know, Charlie and I are sort of got the, you know, Charlie is one of the first people that I heard really passionate about Biscayne Bay, you know, which had been sort of an issue that was, you know, there, but not really at the forefront and had kind of been quiet for some time. And, you know, the first meeting I was in Charlie, you know, all Charlie was talking about at the dais really was Biscayne Bay and, and, and sure was he right. And, you know, last but not least, of course, you talk, you hear from Ron Bergeron, who's just a wealth of knowledge about all these issues and so passionate, just has such a deep love, you know, for South Florida and the issues that we're dealing with. We talked to two you know, uh, Indian tribes, uh, Native American Indian tribes, and we talked to uh, all these stakeholders from agriculture. And my, you know, for me, the most rewarding thing for me um, has just been deepening my love really for, for Florida uh, in general. And it's just been a really, uh, it's been a really great experience for me. So I thank all of you. Thank you, Scott. So I, I, I the, uh, uh, the bright lights out here really just make me go nuts. <laughs> so um, let's go to who's next, Charlie? Is it me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. As always, I'm last, so everything has been said. I'm going to repeat what everybody else has been saying. Well, I think okay. we have Cheryl still. Yeah, we have Jay and Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl? Is it Cheryl? No, you go, you go, Cheryl. Okay, okay. So, so yes, same thing everybody has said. Uh, to me, the most amazing thing was the way this group, uh, you know, came together. Uh, obviously, we all came in at once, which was, you know, first time that had happened. But even as you look now, it's this the way we're set up with the Zoom call, and you look and you look at the diversity that our group has. It's it's incredible. I mean, everything from gender, ethnicity, 
background and, and what we each do or did for a living. I mean, it is so diverse. And, and I remember distinctively in the first couple of meetings that we had uh, when the public would come up, um, you know, people were trying to put labels on our group, uh, saying that we were gonna be all, all pro this or all pro that. Um, and then as I started uh, making my rounds and, and going on my trips to meet the different stakeholders, that's the one thing I told them all. I said, I said, give us a chance. Just give us a chance. Don't have any predispositions on our group. Uh, and, and wait until you see how we uh, make, make decisions, how we come about to decisions before you start putting labels on us. And I think, you know, we've proven everybody that we are going to be objective on everything that we do. We're going to look at the, uh, the, um, the data given to us by our staff. Um, and based on that, we're going to try to make what is the best decision without any predispositions or without an agenda or without being too much pro-environment or too much pro-agriculture or too much pro development uh, or, or any of that sort. And, and a couple of weeks ago, Drew and I went down to meet with the South Bay farmers, um, you know, and I was so happy because they all said, uh, the ones that we met after, you know, they were all very happy. And they said, you know, you guys have been very fair, very fair to everybody. So I'm very proud of that. Um, and most importantly, um, I'm very proud of the fact, uh, as Scott was saying earlier, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands is back on track uh, we got it off the shelf. Uh, we're redesigning um, uh, now the Cutler Wetlands, part of the phase one. Uh, the, uh, uh, over the last two years, we have completed land acquisitions and construction of the last four culverts for the L31 East Flowway. Uh, the Corps is now doing the last uh, two pump, has done two pump stations, and, and we'll be awarding the last two uh, in, in the coming year. Uh, and then we put together uh, phase two of BBCW with the C111 spreader canal into one. And that is, not, that is now known as the bbc -er. Um So uh, as you have all probably read for the last year, Biscayne, Way, Biscayne Bay is in dire, dire need of attention. Uh, that's our crown jewel down here. Uh, and uh, all the uh, uh, lawmakers down here and all the uh, leaders have, have requested from me that, that, that I keep my eye on the ball and I help out in any way that I can to make sure that Biscayne Bay co uh, comes back um, to what it once was. So I will continue my advocacy for that. Um, and uh, other than that, and everybody has said it before, the staff at this agency is absolutely spectacular. Um, I, I didn't know government uh, can be that good, uh, and it is. And uh, so my kudos to Drew and everybody on down from there for uh, your professionalism, everything that you do to educate us and to prepare us for all our meetings. Thank you, Charlie. So uh, I think the last one we have is Cheryl, unless I missed someone, I got a little distracted there for a bit, uh, but we're running low on time at this point. But Cheryl, please. I just wanted to know, I'll be quick, my dogs just got home, but um, is it okay if Scott Wagner introduces me? Yeah, <laughs> please, please do. I want to see what happens. Um, so I, I stood when we were um, at the groundbreaking of the last component of the C-43, I was standing on the berm, the highest point, uh, and looking over that massive area that was going to, um, you know, come alive with that project. And I'm surrounded by staff and I was really almost overcome by just that feeling of accomplishment, not for what I had done because I was new, but uh, accomplishment of what they had done, knowing how long that project had been going on and, and, and that they were at this wonderful point um, and it was, um, it was great for me, you know, it was just pure joy, but nothing compares, and I'm almost done, nothing compares to spending time with stakeholders. Um, when Audubon took, took me from the Bay into the 
Everglades, when the ranchers took me out, going to see the Seminoles, going to hear what is important to them and what it is that they need. So the definition of sustainability is taking care of the needs of the present and the economy and the needs of the present with an eye on the needs of the future. And I feel like that we are striking that balance and that's where we are. And I'm so excited about it. I'm sorry that we're meeting virtually. I had so much fun last year and I'm looking forward to next year. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you contestants for uh, playing Hollywood Squares. Now let's go to our judges and figure out the winner of Hollywood Squares. Judges? Oh my God, there are judges? <laughs> <laughs> is it John yes, well, Drew, thank you for the introduction <clears throat> on the judges. Uh, well, obviously, none of them got it right in the first round um, because, well, Mr. Bergeron was close, but he really, did, I, I questioned um, the number, honestly. Uh, so I don't think anyone got a, a point on the second round. What do you think, Drew? Yeah, you're right. And, and, and the, the, the second round, uh, you know, I think there are all great answers. Some of them didn't quite follow the rules. Um, <laughs> but you have to say that Chauncey did mention hiring Drew Bartlett. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an edge, don't you think, Drew? Well, yeah, you're right. Up. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go with that. And let's declare Chauncey Goss the winner of hey, Hollywood hey. Squares District Edition. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us on Hollywood Squares. This is Drew Bartlett from Hollywood, Florida and wishing you all a great day. Let's give our contestants a round of applause and thank you for joining us. Yay. Thank you, Drew. Yay. Thanks thank Everglades you. Coalition. Bup, 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 bup. Thank you. Bup, 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 bup. <laughs> Look forward to seeing all y'all next Thursday. Yeah, I can't wait to see you guys and gals. Likewise. Be safe and the American dream is still alive and God bless America. And long live the Everglades. Long live the Everglades. <clears throat> oh, what a cute dog. Oh, 